Okay, so thanks for waiting. <laughs> but um, my name's Ari. Obviously, you guys all know me, but some people don't. And um, this is the I'm H optioning our P315 child development class. And so I'm going to go in a little bit deeper into chapter nine, which is about language development. Um, who in this room has taken a foreign language before? Pretty much everyone. Okay, so raise your hand again if you could probably remember the alphabet and most of the numbers, or most of the, some of the numbers, some of the alphabet, a little bit. Okay, does anyone think they could still hold a conversation in the language? Maybe a little bit, a little bit back there. So probably no one would consider themselves fluent in the language that they've taken before. Okay, so what was the hardest part of learning a language and retaining the language for you guys? Conjugation. Verb conjugation. Especially like all the grammar rules and how like certain words like in English go a certain way and in other languages it's not that way at all. Uh huh. I think maybe a lot of pronunciation because I did German and it's really different. Mm -hmm. So I remember I had a hard time trying to get the pronunciation right. I'd say they focused more like in my class more on the writing and reading versus how to speak. Gotcha. The conversation. Okay, that's pretty much what I was expecting because when I took foreign language I had the same feelings about it. Um, I'm going to start off with this quick video just because it's kind of funny but it talks about the importance of um, learning a second language. I wish it was but that's just a goldfish in a bowl and then the cat. <laughs> just, just go with it. <laughs> Okay, so there's that. Okay, so this is just an ad for a um, language school, basically, but um, it does show how language is important and how it is useful to so know a second one. So, okay. So I decided to do this because I personally enjoyed learning Spanish and I think it's interesting to learn a second language. And also, within the next two years, um, I'm going to be moving somewhere south, preferably southwest, and um, I want to work with students who speak a different language, so that's why I personally wanted to do it, but there's also benefits done, found through research, um, like the ones up here on the screen. Uh, you get higher, a lot of students have high achievement in reading vocabulary and grammar in both their native language and the second language they learn. It helps children become more multicultural and just accept and respect people of different cultures, which a lot of times can be hard in classrooms. Um, it strengthens brain flexibility because you use, you have to be able to switch from one language to the other. And sometimes people wonder, like, how do you, do you think in your native language instead of speaking in it? And um, that's why it strengthens your brain flexibility. And then it also promotes um, metalinguist awareness, which is how you actually really understand the language. It's when you know someone, if they're rhyming or if they're using puns for certain words, um, students that can speak at least two languages or more are a lot better at knowing their language. So this is just a little diagram that I put together about the different parts of language. And the most basic is phonetics, which is your sounds. So A is like ah, CH together, CH, things like that. Um, it's the most basic form. And then that turns into semantics, which is your words and your vocabulary. A fun fact that I found is that a baby at 18 months, so a year and a half, will have about 50 words total that they'll know and they can kind of like babble out to you. But then at three years, they hit a boom and they'll be learning a minimum of 20 words a day. So their vocabulary just grows and it keeps growing like that for quite some time. Um, syntax is next and that is how you learn how to form a sentence. So when the child is very young, they'll put their hands up and just say up because they want you to pick them up. And then it might move on to grandma's house, which is two words, and the way they phrase it is kind of like asking a question. And then obviously it moves on to, are we going to grandma's house or can we go to grandma's house? Something along those lines. And then pragmatics is the final part of language which is how you actually interact with someone. Knowing social cues, getting, uh, knowing when it's your turn to talk or when it's your turn to listen. Okay, the first case study I'm going to talk about is with Mario. This is from our book. 
he's a little boy. His um, family speaks Spanish at home. And then he, from the time he was two years old, he went to uh, different English speaking schools, I guess you could say. And this is a note that his kindergarten teacher sent home after two months of being in the school and being in the class. And you'll notice a couple things that really stuck out to me is she notices it, she points out that he's sociable, he talks to everyone, he kind of seems like he's the life of the class, he always likes, he always keeps talking, even to a point where um, it's difficult to wait his turn when others are talking because he just wants to say something. Um, and then he also, uh, she notices, she mentions that he has a slight accent which she suggests that he goes to speech therapy for, but the whole reason that his parents speak Spanish to him at home is because they want him to keep that little bit of culture in him. So they decline the uh, speech therapy. And she also says that you can kind of see him like trying to think of the word that he wants to use. He can think of it in Spanish, but he can't figure out how he wants to say it in English. Um, uh, when he was younger, he was able to talk about what he did in school when he went home but his father also quoted something that said uh, as he got older it got harder to have both for example in history they were talking about uh, industrial revolution in France and it didn't translate very well into Spanish so then they started talking in English at home and then that kind of set a precedent for them to speak about math and science and other things and they stopped talking as much Spanish at home um, also about Mario is when he tested in kindergarten he was kind of on the lower scale he was still an average but on the low average of his vocabulary and his grammar and his literacy skills in class but by the time he got to fourth grade sixth grade eighth grade when they do standardized testing then he was in the 80th and 90th percentile which goes to show that if you raise a child or have a child that speaks two languages even though it might be slow to start there's no real setback in the future Okay, this is how speaking, sp speaking skills go, and I'm going to explain it twice. The first time will be as you learn your first language, and the second time will be when you're learning your second language. So, when you first start learning a language, you hear babies coo and babble and just say random sounds. That's what it first starts as, and then, you'll use, then they'll start using gestures. So, they might point to the fridge. They won't say anything, or they might babble something, you can't understand them, but they're you know that they are hungry or they're thirsty. Then they'll start to use their pronunciation. They'll, under, they'll start using the words and it won't probably be a full sentence or anything, but they'll start to be able to talk. Their conversation will grow and they'll be able to actually have a conversation like, I want juice or I'm hungry, what do you want? I want watermelon or whatever they want. And then their speech will adapt to who they're talking to. So even children at a young age will talk to children younger than them differently than they'll talk to their peers and people older than them. And then they'll be able to tell stories and explain what happened at school today or what did you and mom talk about or something along those lines. Then they'll get, then you'll get to your figurative expressions where you can kind of um, use metaphors and hyperboles and really express yourself. And then the final step is lingo, which to be able to use the lingo, you have to be able to know the culture and you'll really, that's when you're fully immersed into this new language. So, we'll use Spanish as an example because I took that. So, you'll start with sounds like the alphabet. A, B, C, C. Okay, just to start. And then, say you're trying to explain to someone something in that language and you can't remember the word for sink. So, you're <coughs> kind of motioning what it looks like. You're like, turn the faucets on, washing your hands because you can't remember the word. So, you're using your gestures. And then, the pronunciation, you start to learn the words that you need to use, and you might still have some trouble with that, like I can't roll my double R's, but you'll start to learn your pronunciation, the conversation will grow, it'll be slow at first, like hi my name is blah blah blah, and how are you, what are you doing, simple A and B back and forth conversation, and then you'll get better, be able to actually adapt what you're talking to, to the crowd that you're with, so whether it's peers or adults or whatever, and then your narratives, once again kind of goes back to what I said earlier, how they will um, be able to tell stories and explain themselves like background information. Figure of expression, once again, being able to use clauses in their sentences and really just making more of a background. And then the lingo, once again, being able to know the culture 
and that will take some time actually being fully immersed into the situation. Okay, so the timing of learning a new language is key because even though you can learn a new language, like a lot of us probably took high school, different languages, um, if the younger you start, the easier it will be and the better it will be for the student to actually become fluent and acquire this new language. Um, the languages, language areas in the brain are much more fluid and ductile when the children are younger and they can form neur neuron pathways way faster. And they'll probably, depending on how well they are used, they'll stick a lot better. But then if you get older, like at our age, if we try to learn a new language, we have to form new pathways from what we already learned which is a great exercise for your brain, it helps keep you healthy and learning new, something new every day, except for it's just kind of more difficult for it to stick in our head. The pronunciation will be better the younger you learn it. Like I said, if it's something that's kind of natural to you, like rolling your double R's, if that's a, something natural to you, as a two-year-old, you'll be able to do it a lot later where I've never had to do that before my freshman year of high school, and so when I started doing it then, it was harder. And then it also depends on how different the languages are. When a child is young, um, and say you have a five-year-old, and you're going to teach them either Spanish or Japanese, it's going to be about the same difficulty for them. They're an English speaker, and they're either going to learn Spanish or Japanese as a second language. It's going to be just about as difficult. Then, if you fast forward 10, 15 years, and you're trying to teach someone our age those same languages, whatever is more similar to their native language will be easier for them to learn. So that's why we'll learn, like English, speaker, English speakers will learn Spanish a lot more than Japanese just because Japanese is so much different than English is. Okay, so I'm gonna go through some of the approaches that it takes that people take to teach a second language and then the responses that are often seen in students. The first one is bilingual education. And this is just, um, there's four steps to the bilingual education. And the first will be they'll, the children of the native language will have, um, they'll both be taking classes, both the ones who speak it and the ones who don't, in like art and music and PE. And then their actual academic subjects, they'll go to an ESL class and then they'll learn them in their native language. And then step two would be uh, in their, um, they'll start to learn like math and science maybe in their native language but with some English mixed in and if that goes well they'll move on to step three which is going into the classroom and if that goes well then they're mainstreamed and they'll stop their ESL classes and they'll kind of graduate. The problem with this is they'll do it in like two to three years and then they're like okay congratulations you can speak the language good job but they don't fully understand it because that'll take five to seven years to actually get a full new language and um, there's three different types of bilingual education and one, the first one is the transitional one, which um, you teach the regular subjects in the native language, and then English as a completely separate subject, and then you kind of start like teaching the other subjects in English. So it kind of works backwards. And then the developmental bilingual education is you use both, the teacher will use both languages for an indefinite amount of time. So maybe the class will catch on in two months, maybe it'll take them the whole year. There's no real say, but the teacher will teach a class in both languages. And then the dual language instruction, our book loves that instruction. And that is where the class is kind of split. You'll have both native speakers and non-native speakers in the same class, and you'll teach the class in both the native language and the other second language. And so say you have Spanish and English, Spanish and English students in this class, and you're teaching math and Spanish. Well, maybe the English kids are struggling in math right now, so the Spanish students will help the English kids. And then you teach science and English, and now the Spanish students are struggling, and so it's supposed to form like a better bond, a better form of enthusiasm and motivation in the class to like help each other and just really form a bond between these students, and that's why it's so highly praised for its education. Submersion is where you just take the student and you drop them in the class of a different language, and you're kind of like, Best of luck, hope you figure it out. And um, it, this can lead to subtractive bilingualism, which uh, is when the students will take their, they'll lose their native language before they actually acquire the new one. And so then there's kind of this like mislaps in between and they don't have any idea what's going on because they can't remember 
what they used to know and they can't fast forward to what they are supposed to know and so they get into this quiet zone as they call it and they just kind of stop talking and a lot of times this will cause cognitive development problems because the students just shut down basically. And structured English immersion is kind of similar to submersion but it is like throwing English in someone's face like learn as fast as possible within this next year so we can just throw you in with the rest of your peers. And immersion is most likely what you guys have seen before because this is when you learn uh, it's a lot a lot of times for English speakers if they want to learn a new language this is the way they do it and there's a lot of positive things that come with this but sometimes they have problems with the pronunciation and the grammar and that type of thing just because it's different from what they've always known and something that I thought was really neat is that it takes 12 to 15 hours a week of full immersion for someone to fully acquire a language and if you think back if I think back to my high school teaching and if you probably think back to yours you had it for maybe an hour a day five days a week a couple days a week and so you were in there for five hours a week compared to the 12 to 15 that you supposedly need so it probably explains why most of us aren't fluent in the languages that we once took okay and then this part um, this is and well it's actually a book but I just took out a certain chapter of it and um, it's the difference between implicit and explicit learning of languages and implicit means it's acquired so in your first five years of life you're not like this is a noun like teaching you what language is you hear it on TV and you listen to your parents talk and you read it in a book or you see it in a book and it's just kind of all around you and you just hear it and that's kind of how you soak it in whereas explicit is when you get to school and they're saying this is a noun and this is a verb and this is how you conjugate it and you diagram sentences and you go along things like that. Um, the reason that it's so hard for people to learn a second language a lot of times is because of this explicit learning versus implicit learning. Um, you learn the second one and the grammar is hard for you to get. Someone said conjugating verbs is hard for them to do and that's because in our minds when you go back to your native language you never knew why it had to be said like that. Like I went to the park yesterday you didn't know why it changed from go, like I, I don't even, can't even like think of a sentence right now, but you don't know why it changed or you don't know why it was said that way. It just sounds correct in your head because that's what you've heard your whole life. Where you haven't heard this new language your whole life and so the grammar just doesn't make sense and you try to do direct translations and languages don't work like that together. So, um, one of the, my favorite quotes from this whole thing is said that um, prolonged practice in speaking accounts for eventual attainment of native like performance so it kind of goes back to the whole like 12 to 15 hours if you really want to try to learn a new language it just needs to be kind of in your face a lot during the week and the last case study is that this girl um, this is also from our book it's about languages in Cameroon I think is how you say it and uh, this is a quote from um, someone's observation journal of this little girl uh, in this school they speak their native languages and this girl happens to be full full day I think is how you say it and that's what she speaks at home but then when she gets to school she learns Arabic so she can learn how to read the Quran and then she learns French so she can learn how to excel in her classes and it talks about the different ways that language can be taught because in her classes to learn Arabic she it was a lot of repetition like I went here now class repeat it back to me and that's kind of how the teacher taught that whereas in her French classes they were really into um, teaching dialogue and talking to each other and back and forth and talk, working in groups just because that is how they were going to need to use their French language so in the end basically when developing a new language I guess my scarf does not want to stay on today with this microphone but when learning a new language um, speaking it is a huge part of it and encouraging students to speak it is a big part of it too because that's what they're going to need to succeed in their academics so thank you what do you think is the in your opinion the best way to teach children a second language 
Um, I did a lot of extra research on the dual language one that I kind of talked up during the bilingual education just because I think that if you have some students, if all of your students don't know something, if that makes sense, like if everything was in English, then your English students would kind of have an advantage. But doing half and half and having students of each um, language will also, will kind of like encourage everyone to work together. Um, I think that, am I supposed to be recording this part on here? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, but it's just hard to fund that and to find the right methods that you need to take that action because you'll need the teachers who can speak two languages and you'll need um, the training for that teacher and just every like all the little things that go into making this curriculum work for the students is why immersion and submersion are so popular versus bilingual which has been proven to work better so then do you think they should change how they teach in America foreign language do you think they should change it to a different kind, kind of way so the immersion doesn't really work too well I personally do but then at the same time it's a requirement so some students get into it and they take the time to learn it and they listen to the music outside of class and they join the Spanish club or whatever the foreign language club and they do all the extra things and then you have the students who are trying to pass and get through because they just need it to graduate so maybe have an option for students to take that Op, like take that next step into the foreign language if they really like it but I think if you spent the money and the resources to do it for everyone it might be a waste of your time at the end. Um, uh, at one point you said something about how, like, how many hours we need to like they need to spend to learn it like mm -hmm. a week and I know we can't do that that in the classroom just because we don't have enough time in the day so do you think yeah. students should just like spend time at home on their own time or like how should they make up for those hours? Make up like for elementary students or for well like just in general because like I feel like you were right about how many hours we spend like five hours a week is obviously not enough yeah but I just I don't know how we could make up for those hours and I'm just kind of curious if you had yeah um Dr. Smith and I talked about this a little bit just how uh there are like the clubs and the outside activities and depending on the town you're in I mean there's I mean in Fort Wayne there's places that you can go if you want to like help Spanish-speaking people or work with Spanish-speaking people. There's places that you can go if you want those hours and you really want to get involved in the language. But once again, it kind of I feel like it kind of goes back to how much you want yeah. to put into it. It's you put in what you get out, or you get it, you get out what you put in, yeah. both ways. Spanish, Spanish TV is good. Yeah. <laughs> SpongeBob and Spanish and things like that. <laughs> 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 Bailey. Okay, so the elementary schools in our town right now just started doing foreign language. They go to Spanish for 50 minutes Monday morning, and that's it. But then they go to middle school, they have no foreign language, and then they go to high school and they have it again. Do you think it's even worth it to put it in the elementary schools when they only get an hour of it a week and then they go to middle school and get nothing? I mean, because there's nothing in middle school, I don't... I don't want to say it's not worth it because it's strengthening the function of and the flexibility of the child's brain to be able to work back and forth. But I think it's interesting that they do it like for not even a full hour a week for what's elementary school like six or six years or five years. Yeah. So I don't know. It's that's kind of a tough subject because is it is it worth it? But I feel like the kids probably think that they're cool because then they can like count to ten in another language or they can say hola. <laughs> and stuff like that, you know what I mean? <laughs> say, my elementary school, we took um, K-5, you had Spanish every single year, and you kind of learn the same stuff every year, but like to this day, I can still count to like 100 in Spanish, and I can say my colors. But like in middle school and high school, middle school it wasn't required, and in high school you could take Latin, German, like you could All the different options. That, so like I didn't take that in high school, so. Because you already had it for so many years. So I mean, I can say a color or a number, and that's about it, so. <laughs> so is, was it, do you feel like it was worth it to spend that much time on it? I kind of feel like it was because it's still, like, you did a, we did a lot of activities that kind of made you look at, like, quinceaneras and just, like, all the different, even, like, aspects. Of the culture the of the... And not just the language of it. Like, mm -hmm. we had parties, like, Spanish parties and stuff, so... Yeah. Us, so. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? All right.
Okay. Well, hope you guys enjoyed it. Very nice.